Welcome to Thrive Church. We are so happy to have you here with us today. And this week, we're actually uh, celebrating Memorial Day. And, and for, for many of us, Memorial Day kind of signifies the beginning of, of summer and kind of a time of celebration. But for some of us, it is uh, a different kind of uh, holiday, a day where we remember those who have fallen in battle in service of our country. So I would just like to uh, take a few moments across all of our campuses just to pray uh, for those families and those who have suffered loss. Will you join me? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we are so grateful for the men and the women who have served our country, and many of whom have paid the ultimate sacrifice of giving their lives in service for our freedom. And Lord, that reminds us of Jesus Christ, who also died to bring us freedom and new life. We ask you to comfort those who are still experiencing loss, who are sad, who are grieving. Comfort them by your Holy Spirit. Bring peace and freedom into their lives, Lord. And we thank you for the sacrifice that so many have paid so that we can worship freely, so that we can gather without fear. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, we welcome you to Thrive Church. My name is Judah Thomas, and I'm the lead pastor here. And we have three locations, Torrington, Terryville, New Britain, as well as online. And we are so grateful to have you. And I want to let you know, next week, uh, we're starting a brand new series. Today is the, the final uh, service in Tricking Jesus. Next week, we're starting a brand new series called Nerves of Steel. And it's all about uh, the story of Daniel. We're going to be studying Daniel. It's going to be a great series. We'd invite you to come out for that. But again, today we're concluding tricking Jesus. And in this series, we've discussed a variety of rules that, that the Jewish people were expected to follow, especially someone who was a rabbi like Jesus was. There was all of these rules. And, and just last week, our, uh, we, we've talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about Sabbath, and we've talked about other rules that they had to follow now, these Jewish commandments came mostly from the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is called the, the Pentateuch. It's the, the beginning of the Bible. And there's all of these lists of commands, or, or they would call them mitzvahs. And surely you've probably heard of the Ten Commandments, which are the, the, the most uh, famous of all of these commands. But if you count through all of the different commands, there's around 613 different rules and regulations that the Jews were required to follow. There was 248 rules that these were things that they should do, and there was 365 negative things. These were things that the Jews should avoid. And some of them were things like, like honoring the Sabbath and what constituted work, and some of them were, were ceremonially, uh, ceremonially clinic, cleansing things and, and different purification rituals and things like that. And, and the religious leaders of the day and throughout the centuries would debate these things. They would debate the intricacies of the law. They would debate the intricacies of these different commands. And that's what brings us to the last and final trap that they tried to set for Jesus here. We see it in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. It says, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, now, if we back up, the, the Sadducees, they were a, a particular sect of Judaism, and they had just asked him a, a question about marriage and about the eternal life and all of these things, and, and, and here, Jesus had silenced them. He says, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, were these Jewish religious and political parties. So we could relate to them probably in our country, most like Democrats and Republicans, right? They, they're two different parties, all kind of representing uh, some different beliefs. The Sadducees were generally the, the wealthy, the elite 
of the community. They had more conservative beliefs. They looked at scripture and they believed everything that it said and they did not deviate from it. They figured anything that God ever wanted to speak to them would be contained in the written word of God. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in a variety of oral traditions. These were, were oral uh, traditions that were passed down from rabbi to rabbi. So as they would discuss the scripture, some rabbi would say, well, I think that means this. And everybody would be like, yes, we agree. And then they would pass these things down. And so these two different groups were at odds with each other. But as the old saying goes, nothing unites people together more than a common enemy. Right? They say that's why grandparents and grandkids get along so well, because they have the common enemy of the parent in the middle. So nothing unites people in these two polar opposite sides. You have the, the liberals and the conservatives, so to speak, and they're always at odds, but now they're teaming up together because they're like, we've got to stop this guy. We have to do whatever we can to stop him. And, and, and surely, as they ask him a question, that surely they will find fault. They probably role played with each other. Like, well, what if he says this? Well, here's how we'll respond. And what if he says that? Well, here's how we'll respond. And, and they figured out all of the traps of, oh, okay, you respond if he says this and you respond if he says that. And they figured out that they would uh, ultimately be able to trap him with this question. So again, verse 34 says, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. And one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. I don't know how he got the, the job, if, if he was the smartest of the bunch or he drew the short straw, I don't know, but they looked around and said, you go and ask him this question. So this expert, this is like a, a college professor, somebody who, who, who's very brilliant, he's coming to ask this question and he asks the question, which seems reasonably simple to us, but look at the question that, that he asks, he says, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees asking Jesus which commandment was the greatest was a trap in two different ways. They figured maybe if he answers wrong, they could trap him in some form of blasphemy. Or at least, if he answers it, maybe they could use his answer to, to alienate some of his followers and they could bring some division there. So they were trying to, to kind of uncover some weakness in his debate. Like these, these were, were complicated questions. Now, some of the Jews thought that upholding the Sabbath was the most important command that they could follow. They believed that, that upholding the Sabbath was, was chief. Others would debate that it was, you know, not worshiping idols. And some thought it was the, the cleansing rituals that they would have. And, and they would argue back and forth and back and forth. Continuing in verse 37, Jesus replies, he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Why don't you underline that? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second, here's a bonus one for you guys. He's like, you know, here, I'm gonna give you an extra one, the second one, but it's second, but it's equally important. It's just as important as the first one. The second is equally important. Underline this, love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40 says, the entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. He's saying it can all be summed up in these things. Loving God first and foremost and loving your neighbor as yourself. If you think of even the Ten Commandments, you know, if we are loving God, then we are honoring him. We're not having any idols. We're not taking his name in vain. If we're loving other people, we're not being envious. We're not committing murder and adultery and, and stealing and all of these things. He's saying, if you focus on these two things, instead of avoiding these bad things, focus on showing love to God first and foremost and to other people, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two things. Now, the question may seem random to us, as to why they'd ask him to rank different commands. But this was a, a common, and it was kind of a divisive discussion at the time. That They were prepared to counteract any response that he gave. They were, they were prepared to, to argue any defense that he gave. And, and, and they were trying to kind of uncover 
you know, what he was made out of. For example, sometimes people will come to me and they'll say that they, uh, that they play an instrument, say they play guitar. And usually the first question that I ask is, is who, what kind of music do you listen to or, or, uh, or what kind of music do you like to play? And, and I can usually judge what kind of, you know, band or what kind of, uh, what level of musician they are by their response to that question. If they come out and say, oh, oh, I just love, you know, Britney Spears, I'm like, okay, you know, maybe we got to work on this a little bit. But if they come out, they say, say something, you know, a little bit more, you know, obscure, like, you know, say, say Joe Satriani or, or even Eric Clapton, or, or they're like, oh, I'm really into, you know, old school Metallica stuff. Or you're like, wow, okay, you definitely know, you know, the instrument and you understand what good musicianship is. And it's, it's a simple question, but it's a way to uncover the depth of someone's knowledge in the craft. And in the same way, they're asking him, which is the greatest commandment? And they're prepared to counteract any argument that he has except this one. Because he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In your notes, Jesus says that love is the most important rule. That's what it comes down to. He's saying love. They had never thought of that before. They never thought about this before. And and, and if you look at the story, which is also recorded in the Gospel of Luke, Right after this conversation, the Pharisee, who's kind of caught off guard by this response, he naively asks this following question in verse, uh, chapter 10 of Luke, verse 29. The man wanting to justify his actions, right? What does that mean? That means that he probably wasn't the most loving person in the world. He'd probably been obeying the 613 laws his entire life, but he wasn't demonstrating love to God and love to other people. So he's wanting to justify his actions. So he asks Jesus, and and who is my neighbor? Think of this. This is an expert in religious law and the only response he can formulate of who is my neighbor. So Jesus decides to give him a parable, a story that Jesus made up to illustrate a spiritual truth. We know of it as the good Samaritan. Now, we talked about Samaritans this past week, and and, and the Samaritans were people that the Jews did not like. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans. There was a racial divide between the two of them. They would not socialize with Samaritans. They would not, you know, know, uh, spend time with them. They did not see them as equal. And so Jesus tells them a story about a Jewish man who was going on a trip. And along the trip, he was robbed and beaten and left half for dead in the ditch on the side of the road. Then Jesus says, then a priest comes by. A priest was somebody who, who was you know, leading worship in the temple on a regular basis. This is someone equivalent to say a pastor in one of our churches today. He says a, a priest comes by and seeing the man lying in the ditch, he goes to the other side of the road and keeps on going by. Then he says, a Levite comes by. A Levite was a temple assistant. This is someone who we might think of as a, as a ministry leader or someone who is very involved with volunteering and nonprofit things. So the Levite comes by, also seeing the man in the ditch and crosses to the other side of the road and continues on. Now think about the audience with whom Jesus is speaking. He's speaking to priests and Levites right now. So he's basically coming down on them. He's like saying, yeah, there's this dude and he got beat up and left for dead and there was somebody a lot like you and you just blew right by him and didn't even stop. And then a despised Samaritan comes by. And all of they're like, oh man, what did he do? He probably stabbed him, right? He probably kicked him while he's down. And Jesus says, yeah, he sees him there and he goes over and he bends down and he cleans the man's wounds. And he picks him up and he puts him on his donkey and he leads him to the closest end and he puts him up in the end and pays for his room and board and tells the innkeeper, make sure you take care of him and when I come back by again, if he's incurred any further expenses, I will gladly pay it. So here Jesus is telling the story. It's basically saying, you know the people that you dislike so much, the Samaritans? Well, they're the hero of of this story. See, following this parable was an answer to who the neighbor was. The guy said, who's my neighbor? 
Jesus is basically saying, your enemy. In your notes, Jesus said that your enemy should be your neighbor. He's like, we need to treat them with love and with respect. Jesus was essentially shaming them, saying that their enemies were better than them at following God's own commands. These were fighting words for sure. I mean, he's looking in the eyes of these religious leaders and saying, yeah, you know, people like you would just pass this guy by, but the Samaritan, he was the hero of the story. He goes on in verse 36. Now, which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? So again, recapping the story, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they come up with a plan to trick Jesus. Say, so what's the greatest commandment? They send their smartest and best and brightest. What, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus replies, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And then the guy's caught off guard. Who's my neighbor? Jesus tells this story, and then Jesus says, so now who do you think was a neighbor? And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now when I read this, the one who showed him mercy, I just like to read between the lines a little bit. He didn't say the Samaritan, right? Because he was probably hanging his head in shame. Like, how do I even answer this? I can't say it was the Levite. I can't say it was the priest. And I'm certainly not gonna say it's the Samaritan. I'm just gonna say the one who showed him mercy. Like, maybe it's him. And Jesus says, yes, go and do the same. This guy couldn't even mention that it was a Samaritan. Shots were fired. This was an inferno of a parable that enraged the listeners of the day. Because... The good guy was someone that they thought was a bad guy, the Samaritan. And and the bad guys in this story, the Levite and the priest, were somebody that they held in high regard as the best of the best of the best. So these religious leaders would sit around all day debating the intricacies of the law, which is greater you know, is, is it the Sabbath? Is, is it you know, thou shalt not envy? And what are the implications of these rules in our life? And how could you perhaps break one of these laws unknowingly? And Jesus is basically looking them in the eye and saying, you've missed the whole point. You've missed it. You, you wanted some scholarly debate about the intricacies of the law, and yet you missed the very basics. You miss the fundamentals. Sure, you could argue all the intricacies of, of what to do if a, if a gnat inadvertently flies into your mouth and it's not kosher, so what do you do in that circumstance, but you won't go and show love to your fellow man? Like, what are we arguing here? It says you need to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. This is our feelings, our emotions. We need to to love him with all of our heart. We need to love him with all of our mind. This is our, our thoughts and our intellect, putting our mind on him. To love him with all of our, our soul, all of our, our being, all of our life. In your notes, God wants us to love him with our whole being, not holding anything back. Not holding back, not saying, okay, I just love you partially. He's saying that we need to love God with all that we are. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Let your life be lived in service for the king. Let your life be a reflection of the love that you have for our God, love God with everything that you do. Are your actions showing love to God and others? Examine the actions that you've had in your life this past week. Does your behavior, did it, did it show love towards God and towards other people? The thoughts that you thought, did your thoughts show love to God and to other people? The feelings that you experienced, did that show love to God and to other people? See, in your notes, following rules is easy, but having a relationship with God takes work. See, it's easy for us to follow rules. It's like, just tell me what you expect. Tell me what the minimum is. Show me the rules, and I will obey the rules. And many of us say, well, you know what? We don't live in the Jewish culture, so this doesn't relate to us. And yet, we formulate our own version of these rules in our own life. You know, are we loving the rules more than the relationship with God? Are we loving the law more than the Lord? Are we loving the guidelines more than our God? Are we loving the commands more than the creator of the universe? What are we fixing our thoughts on? Oh, it's easy 
to follow the rules, but it's much harder to walk in relationship with God. See, many of us, we like to just learn about God, but we don't actually have a relationship with God. It's kind of like my relationship with hobbies. See, uh, in my life, I- I've had so many hobbies. I mean, I, it's just, I can't even count how many hobbies I've had. Everything from, from sewing uh, to, to rock climbing, um, from backpacking to candle making, from, from cycling, mountain biking, uh, uh, road cycling to uh, all kinds of, you know, ways of roasting and brewing coffee. I mean, all of these things. And, and, and what I realized at one point is that I was spending far more time researching my hobbies than I was actually spending doing them. It was around that time that my wife pointed out to me that I didn't really have, you know, 80 or 90 hobbies. I really only had one hobby, and that hobby was researching hobbies, and that I enjoyed the research process more than I actually enjoyed getting out and doing the things. For many of us, that's how our relationship with God is. We we know a lot about God, but we don't actually know him. In your notes, many people know about God, but do not know him. Do we simply know about him? Have we simply read scripture a little bit, but we have not taken the time to apply it into our life and build a strong relationship with God? Some of us would say, oh yes, God, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of God. You know, I'm one of his followers. I follow him online. I follow him and and you know, it's great. I see everything that he does. I don't really know him. You know, we don't really talk that much. But, but, but I know who he is. See, God wants friends and not fans. And so that's what Jesus is getting at here. He says that the first commandment is that you should love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And the second commandment, the second commandment. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever hated somebody before? Just think about like, have you ever hated somebody? You're like, yeah, I was hating on somebody today on the way here. You know, maybe you've hated somebody before. And here, Jesus is saying, love your neighbors as yourself. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, he says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. And anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. Verse 8, but anyone who does Not love does not know God, for God is love. Underline that. Anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So do you love God? Well, we say, oh, yes, of course I love God. How about other people? Do you love other people? Well, you know what? I I love God, but I just can't stand other people, you know? I've, I've, I've actually heard pastors say this before. Like, you know, I love God and I love being a pastor, but it's just all the people I can't stand. I'm like, hey, buddy, you can't pastor anybody if you don't have people. Like, you have to love God, and then that love has to flow through you and flow to other people. In your notes, when you follow God, you don't get to choose the people that you love. You don't get to choose the people you love when you follow God. See, because he says, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. He says, I want you to love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good for those who treat you wrong. He has called us to show love to everyone, to each and every person. See, these leaders, these Sadducees, these Pharisees, they had prepared themselves to argue the intricacies of the Sabbath law, but not of love. They had prepared themselves to argue the intricacies of ceremonial cleansing, but not of love. They had prepared themselves to to argue the depths of tithing and what you should and should not tithe on, but they did not know how to respond to love. See, because the Pharisees, they were better at following rules than following God, than loving God. They were better at following rules than loving people. Truth be told, they loved themselves. They wanted people to to see them. They drew attention to themselves. This is why they they dressed the way they did, so people would admire them walking down the street. So people would say, oh, there's a holy man of God. And Jesus is saying, you know, you're the bad guy in the story. You're the guy that, that passed the person who's injured. You're the guy who wouldn't stoop over and help someone who's in need because you don't have love. Do we love ourselves more than we love God? 
praying prayers like, God, bless my plans, and Lord, let my will be done, making it all about me, or are our thoughts fixed on him? Are we like the, the Pharisees? As long as I do these certain things, as long as, I, as long as I read scripture, as long as I pray over my food, and as long as I listen to K-Love, then I'm gonna be okay with God. As long as I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I don't chew, and I don't run with boys who do, then I will be okay with God. Then I'm good, it's all good. As long as I do these things. This is in John 13, 34. Jesus is speaking, he says, now I am giving you a new commandment, love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Verse 35, this should be the mantra for our faith because he says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. What is this saying to you and to me? This is saying that God is concerned with how much love you show to other people. And he's even more concerned when you don't show love to other people. He's saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Then prove it, not by adhering to a bunch of rules. Prove it by the love. It says that they'll know that we are Christians by our love, not by how much scripture we have memorized, not by how well we can follow the rules, not by how we dress or the music we listen to or the car that we drive or the way that we vote. He says, they'll know that you're Christians by the love that you show. And in the world today, and in the church today, we see people time and time again proving that they do not love God because they cannot show love to other people. See, God is commanding us to love him first, but then to love others equally. God has called us to show love. This is the most important thing that we can do. You wanna know what's important? You wanna follow Jesus and you wanna know what it all comes down to? It all comes down to this. Loving God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And if we do these things, then we have then fulfilled all of the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for giving us your word, which teaches us and instructs us. And Lord, we want, to, we want to love you more. We want to love others more as you loved us. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, I believe that he's calling you right now through the Holy Spirit. He's inviting you into his family. If you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you say with your mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord, that you will be saved. Won't you call on his name and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And make that decision and commitment to follow him. God, we're sorry for the times that we've made it all about us. We're sorry for the times that we've made it more about rules and regulations than about loving you and loving others. Let us be reflections of your love. Let us demonstrate love in every interaction that we have, from the person that we find the, the most like us to the person who is so far different from us, we almost can't even stand them. Lord, let your love flow through us to that person. Let us show love. Let us not show hatred or anger. Let your love flow through us so that we can fulfill these commands from Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Let's stand together.